Welcome again, folks, to the Washington Babylon podcast with Ken Silverstein. This week, Ken is taking on a new assignment and therefore is out of the studio. So first, I, Andrew Stewart, am speaking with Dr. Gerald Horn, the prolific historian about the 1619 Project by the New York Times and a recent bizarre rebuke to the project featuring a coterie of Ivy League scholars who clearly have nothing better to do, the Wall Street Journal, and the ultra-bonkers Trotskyist World Socialist website. So, Dr. Horn, in the past decade, you've been writing a fantastic set of books about the origins of these United States and dismantling piece by piece the progressive era narrative about the creation of liberal democracy on this continent as a movement forward for the history of governance. Um, and this seems to have trickled down into the 1619 project in the New York Times. I'm wondering what your appraisal and thoughts are on it at the outset. Well, as you know, in August of 2019, the New York Times Magazine, under the leadership of the MacArthur-winning journalist, Nicola Hannah-Jones, authored and produced what they call the 1619 Project, which will be circulated in public schools. And uh, number one, the project suggested that it was trying to connect the ills of black America today to the past, and therefore it focused on 1619, which they said was the initial arrival of bonded African labor on these shores. And the project included a number of essays by different scholars and writers, most of whom were black, by the way. And it helped to engender a firestorm of invective and protest from the Wall Street Journal editorial page from Ivy League scholars, from certain folks who consider themselves to be radical. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, if you go onto Twitter, you'll still see an ongoing flame war uh, with uh, flame attacks against the 1619 Project and responses by defenders of the 1619 Project. Now, uh, as you noted correctly, uh, I have an iron in this fire. Uh, on Twitter, Hannah Jones acknowledged that she was familiar with my work, but you know, I, I, I don't blame the New York Times for not quoting me. They're in enough trouble already with the ruling class without saying that they were relying upon my work. And one of the more controversial aspects of, of the 1619 Project was the idea that slavery had something to do with the slaveholders' rebellion in 1776, led by slave owners like George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, Patrick Henry, etc. Uh, many of the critics said, how dare you suggest that slavery had something to do with what amounted to a slaveholders' rebellion? And then secondly, what helped to incur the wrath of the critics was a point mentioned that the sainted and vaunted Abraham Lincoln at one point during his administration uh, was negotiating to deport in mass the black population of the United States. Now, I've dealt with this in a number of books. I dealt with that uh, in my book, uh, Negro Comrades of the Crown. I dealt with it in my book, The Deepest South, the United States, Brazil, and the African Slave Trade, because Brazil was one of the places where uh, the administration intended to see us, send us. Of course, the Brazilians and the other destinations decided they didn't want us. <laughs> so that's why we're still here in North America, I guess, uh, speaking English as opposed to in Brazil speaking Portuguese. And of course, the historians, uh, rather predictably, uh, after the Brazilians said they didn't want us, then start to talk about how Lincoln evolved, <laughs> evolved away from the deportation in mass directive. And so this has been a very interesting and revealing episode. In some ways, I think it, it represents a rebuke of the U.S. left, which I don't think is updated 
it, its historical analysis, to put it mildly, and is still relying upon what I would consider to be outdated theses, it would be as if in biology class there is no acknowledgement, no acknowledgement of DNA, for example. Uh, you're still acting as if uh, Watson and Crick and the other who uncovered DNA uh, never existed. And uh, in some ways, as I said, I think it's a rebuke of the U.S. left. Now, uh, and basically every sector of the U.S. left, I'm afraid to say, uh, despite you know, the fact that after 1776, the slave trade uh, increased. And after 1776, by 1790s, as I said in my book on Cuba, the United States had replaced Spain as the major carrier of Afri- enslaved Africans to Cuba. By the 1840s, uh, the United States had basically seized control of the largest market, which is Brazil. And, of course, the dispossession of the indigenous population increased exponentially after 1776. <laughs> and we all know uh, that it, it's not a stretch at all to draw a connection between the depredations inflicted upon Africans and indigenous populations and the depredations now being inflicted uh, upon Iraqis, Iranians, uh, Afghans, uh, people too numerous to mention. So, uh, you know, in some ways, the 1619 Project represents a failure of imagination, not to mention scholarship and politics and ideology uh, of various sectors of the U.S. left. But it begs the question of why in the New York Times? And I, and I think that's a very good question. I think that, number one... I, th- I think that these black black people in general uh, have less room for error and uh, are, are less susceptible, it seems to me, to being seduced by the creation myths and the mythology of the United States. We're more sensitive to the rise of recipient fascism that is signaled by Trumpism uh, because that's why you have Black Lives Matter. Uh, that's why you have campaigns uh, involving black people against the death penalty where we're overrepresented on death row. And then, of course, there, in, in terms of New York Times, as the investor class could tell you, there's a real danger from the point of view of the Salzburger family that that paper might not survive. I mean, journalism, as you know, in its present iteration in the United States, it's a slowly dying enterprise. The Graham family uh, sold the Washington Post to Jeff Bezos, reputedly the richest man in the United States, if not on planet Earth for what he would consider to be coins found hidden in his couch, about $250 million, And they were able, that is say, the Graham family was able to escape. So thus far, the Salzburger family is trying to hang on. Uh, but I think that the New York Times, like any enterprise, they're searching for new markets. And in fact, Peter Coquelin, who is a historian at the University of North Carolina, and his critique in the conservative British journal, The Spectator, of the 1619 Project, Compared to the New York Times, he called it the Midtown edition of the New York Amsterdam News. Now, the New York Amsterdam News is the black paper in Harlem. It's been in existence for more than a century. And I guess he was objecting to all this black content, what he considered to be too much black content in the New York Times. But I think the New York Times, they're searching for new markets, as well they should. And they're in New York, which has the largest black population in the United States of America. So perhaps, understandably, they're trying to reach out to this black population. And then the editor, of course, Dean McKay, is from this black American from an old line New Orleans family. I think I talk about his family in my jazz book. And uh, so so I I think that those are some of the questions uh, that strike me with regard to the 1619 Project. And I should also say that in in some ways, the the scholars in particular, they, they feel offended. If you look at the... Uh, interviews on this website of the so-called Worldwide Socialist Web, you'll see these scholars saying, some of them are saying, uh, you know, I opened my paper in August 2019, I saw this special issue on slavery, and they didn't even, they didn't even consult me. <laughs> How dare they do <laughs> something on slavery without consulting me, as if they're gatekeepers. And I think what might, what might be happening is that because of the crisis that, that U.S. imperialism faces, not only in terms of recipient fascism, but the rise of China, uh, which bids, bids fair to leave the United States sprawling in the dust and uh, making it more difficult to grab the low-hanging fruit of imperialism, that this might be creating conditions where there is a historiographical shift. As, as you know, uh, in graduate school in history, 
oftentimes the historians will say, although obviously they don't always mean it, that our only obligation to history is to rewrite it, and history is argument without end. But of course, with regard to certain issues, they're, they're settled. So you're not supposed to argue, like 1776 and the creation of the United States. Um, you might recall that after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the now Stanford uh, scholar Francis, Francis Fukuyama wrote this piece, The End of History. That is to say that socialism is gone, he, he thought, <laughs> and that uh, the capitalism is won, end of history, no more debate, end of story. And so in some ways, the historians with regard to 1776 and their other sacred cows, they're talking about the end of historiography. There's no debate about 1776. It has to be seen as one of the greatest leap, leaps forward in world history. Now, I think that these historians should realize that in light of the fact that there, there's this trend in, in the United States to denigrate and castigate just about every revolutionary process you could think of, not least the Cuban Revolution of 1959, and the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917. So given that context, it seems to me inevitable that people would go back and say, well, wait, what about 1776? In light of the fact that the Bill of Rights, supposedly this great gift to humanity, did not apply to the enslaved African population, which was considered to be property. You had Native Americans who were considered citizens until the 1920s. And then there's this whole misreading of the trajectory of the United States. That is to say that you would think that John Brown, the heroic uh, anti-slavery crusader who gave his life to try to overthrow slavery, represented the majority sentiment amongst Euro Americans, which certainly he did not. Uh, you would think that uh, William Lloyd Garrison, another uh, abolitionist, represented majority sentiment amongst Euro Americans. Likely not. We know that before 1861, most of these presidents uh, were slave owners, including George Washington, including Andrew Jackson, who was Trump's hero, who was probably a slave trader as well. And we also, these historians oftentimes fly by, uh, in terms of their histories, what's oftentimes intriguing is what they choose to ignore. And what they oftentimes ignore is what I call the white man's country faction. That is to say, that uh, oftentimes what they call anti-slavery was an effort by dominant Euro-American opinion to exclude black people altogether. For example, in Oregon, when it comes into the Union in the 1850s, no black people were allowed. And that remained in place for decades to the point where now, even today, Portland, Oregon has one of the smallest black populations in the United States of America. You could make an argument that since we haven't grappled fully, not only with the white man's country ideology, but also with the fact that despite the military defeat of the so-called Confederate States of America, they were not defeated politically or ideologically, uh, which is why the historian Heather Cox Richardson has a book coming out soon called How the South Won the Civil War, and how and why it is that we still have a gentrification stalking the land that's disproportionately impacting uh, black people, I would say, how we have a homelessness stalking the land, which is disproportionately affecting uh, black people, creating these uh, so-called white spaces. And speaking of which, why it is that even myself as a historian, <laughs> sometimes, like I was at uh, Johns Hopkins doing research on about this book on Texas I'm working on. This was a few months ago. Uh, when I go into the library, this is in Baltimore, right? It's almost like people are saying, what are they doing here? You know? What is this black? Like they had never seen a black person before in Baltimore, uh, because they're, they're reflecting this white man's country ideology, the creation of white spaces, how black people are just supposed to be harassed when you wander into territory that you sir, you supposedly don't belong in, and th th these are all realities that these historians sometimes they, they seem blissfully unaware. Of. As a matter of fact, sometimes these historians, believe it or not, they are proud of the fact that they don't keep up with current events. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they'll spend their whole life like focusing on, say, 1861 to 1865, and so they sacrifice breath for death, and then they, then they'll try to pontificate about 1776. And even the, the, the scholars uh, and some of the critics who focus on what they call the American Revolution, they started in the 1770s. And as my work has shown, you got to start it in the 1600s and then trace these trends. I have a book coming out in a few months. Uh, on the 16th century, 
because as we know, to, to critique the 1619 project, uh, the story of enslaved Africans, you could say it begins in St. Augustine, Florida in 1565 under the Spanish, or you could say in the 1520s from their perch in Santo Domingo, the Spanish bring enslaved Africans to what is now South Carolina. The Africans rebel, defect to the North, to the uh, Native American side, chase the Spanish back across the water, uh, which then creates an opening for the English to arrive in what they call Virginia in 1607, which is why we're sitting here speaking English, not Spanish. And so... Uh, these historians, I hope this leads them to do a, a deep self-criticism. And I would say as well that that holds true for many of our friends on the left as well. One concept that you have been raising a lot in titles, you've mentioned it several times already, um, and I think it doesn't get enough discussion on a very basic level, is your own diagnosis of white supremacy as ideology um, which has been getting an interesting amount of traffic in its own subtle way over the last couple of months. We have, for example, uh, the recent passage of uh, Noel Ignatiev that led to mm. a discussion of the meaning of whiteness as a concept. Um, we've talked several times about uh, W.E. Du Bois. Uh, others would extract an idea derived from perhaps uh, the late Theodore Allen and his concept of the white mm -hmm. race being invented. Some would use notions from Althusser, others from Gramsci. I'm wondering just w how you define the concept and think about it. Well, first of all, uh, thank you for mentioning those writers. I, I would mention a few others as well for bibliographical purposes. Uh, Nail Urban Painters, The History of White People, which is one of the more ambitious uh, interventions in the scholarship on whiteness. Of course, there is a David Rodiger, R O E D I G E R, of the University of Kansas, uh, who, was, who was a pioneer uh, in this, although he obviously uh, borrowed from Du Bois, as he fairly well acknowledges, including his, his uh, initial book, The Wages of Whiteness. And there, there's the limits of whiteness, running in Americans and the everyday politics of race by Nada Mago. Magubule, M-A-G-H-B-O-U-L-E-H. -E then, of course, there's my work as well. And I think one of the things I try to suggest is that whiteness is inextricably connected in North America to settler colonialism. And settler colonialism, invasion of North America and the dispossession on a mass basis of the indigenous population, up to and including genocide, Oftentimes, it was a product of class collaboration. Uh, in my 17th century book, uh, I spent a lot of time talking about Bacon's Rebellion in 1676, uh, which was a rebellion by mostly Euro-American men of various class backgrounds, revolting uh, London because they thought London was aggressive enough to seize the land of the Native Americans. And, 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 and that's another thing. You know, too many historians... They don't really critique this idea of seizing land of the Native Americans. They often have to act like it's a step forward. Like they, when they talk about the free soil movement of the 1850s, I can tell you that the Native Americans, didn't, <laughs> in any case, Texas secedes from Mexico in the 1830s because Mexico had abolished slavery uh, in the 1820s. Then Texas couldn't withstand the abolitionist pressure from London and revolutionary Haiti and crawls into the Union in 1845, and then Texas secedes in 1861 and joins the so-called Confederate States of America. But the episode I was going to cite takes right, right, right before uh, Texas joining the Confederate States, because part of the complaint was that the, the, the U.S. government wasn't doing a good job of routing the Native Americans. And so you had a U.S. government agent who wanted to put the Native Americans in Texas in a certain uh, precinct, uh, on reservations. And the Euro Texans said, hell no. They killed the agent and then proceeded to liquidate the Native Americans. <laughs> you know, these people are out of control. And then, after the Confederate States lose, this is going to be the uh, major point in this upcoming book. You know, you know about Juneteenth, I'm sure. Yep. You know, this, this idea that June 19, 1865, Gordon Granger of the U.S. government, he comes to Galveston, tells the Negroes, y'all are free. Y'all didn't know that? You know, the Confederacy surrendered 
two months earlier, the Appomattox, or the Emancipation Proclamation, January 1st, 1863. But what I'm going to un- unveil is that you, you may recall that during the U.S. Civil War, 1861 to 1865, uh, Paris had put their henchman, Maximilian, uh, in power in Mexico. And Texas really s- suffered less than most of the Confederate states in terms of devastation. After, and when Jefferson Davis was trying to escape, he was trying to get to Texas, you see, because the idea was that they were going to rejoin Mexico under the French and then have either slavery or 99-year lease would be a de facto slavery for the Negroes. But what happened is that uh, the U.S. government, to its credit, a routes of Maximilian, Benito Juarez, a Mexican hero, is installed in power. You have black Americans like George Washington Williams, the subject of a biography by the late historian John o. Franklin, uh, who join in with the forces of Juarez to rout Maximilian and his cronies. And then, of course, you still have this Confederate exodus into Mexico, hundreds if not thousands of leading Confederates. And then many of them, they, they wind up going from, te- from Mexico to, to Egypt, to, to London, to Paris. Uh, and in my book, The White Pacific, I talk about the Confederate diaspora in the South Sea, where they start a new slave trade featuring Melanesians, the indigenous people of Fiji and Papua New Guinea, and, and turning them into bonded labor in uh, Queensland, Australia, for example. And then the uh, Kingdom of Hawaii intervenes, which leads to it being overthrown <laughs> by the U.S. by the 1890s, and then entering the Union in 1959, and unless you, and according to pre-September 2016, Donald J. Trump, uh, the allegation that the 44th U.S. president was born there in 1961 is wholly fallacious. So there's so much mythology dealing with U.S. history, that it should keep scholars and historians busy for decades to come. One figure you just mentioned in passing was Andrew Jackson, and it's an interesting coincidence that one of these Ivy League historians, Sean Villance, has actually written a very apologetic biography of Jackson. And I was wondering what your thoughts were on that whole line of thought. Um, He's been a particularly nasty figure in regards to uh, the 2008 primary between Obama and Clinton um, ranks very vociferous material back then. Well, uh, I have to say I haven't read his biography of um, Andrew Jackson, although I am familiar with his work. I am familiar with the fact that one of his sternest critics (laughs) was his uh, now retired colleague, Neil Urban Painter, who I mentioned a moment ago. They were both at Princeton together. And I always wondered how their conversations in the hallway went, because she was uh, rather cold, as they say, with regard to Professor Willings. And, of course, at Princeton, I remember he was involved in an episode trying to liquidate African-American studies under the guise of integration now, which, of course, understandably and justifiably was rebuffed and repudiated. Oh, wow. And... I think that it's not just him. I mean, his colleague, James McPherson, now retired. I remember September 2001, uh, after the attack on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. Uh, McPherson was on NPR, Talk of the Nation, discussing his latest book, Antietam, which is a book that's interesting. You know, it talks about how the Lincoln government, uh, after the blows it absorbed in this pivotal Civil War battle, tended to pivot, recognize that maybe they needed to have Negroes in the armed forces, et cetera. And so, understandably, the uh, interviewer said, well, you know, the embers are still burning in lower Manhattan and in Virginia, where the Pentagon is located. Do you think that this episode will cause the U.S. government to pivot? <laughs> it's like this disastrous attack with 3,000 people dead. And he demurred and declined because, you know, historians, they only talk about the past. They don't talk about the present. And I think that, that that's one of the, the contributions of the 1619 Project, despite certain weaknesses, which is understandable, which is that it tries to suggest that many of the problems that black people face have historical roots, believe it or not. 
<laughs> you know, I know that's a novel concept to some. It's certainly a novel concept to many of these critics uh, who would think, uh, who would like you to believe that the Constitution settled everything. Actually, that's that's the substance of uh, Willens' new book, No Property in Man. And, and it, it took Jake Silverstein, the editor of the New York Times Magazine. I, I recommend that your listeners look at his reply to their critique, where he points out that, well, you know, I'm down with the Constitution, but I think it was people's struggles that led to conditions changing, more so than a piece of paper drafted by slave owners like James Madison. I mean, I would hope that that's the ABCs of reality, but apparently not. Because these folks, they tend to see, like, the Constitution as a thing in itself, the past as a thing in itself. They're very narrowly educated. They don't look at Canada and ask the basic question, which is Canada was under British rule, didn't have the so-called revolution, but Canada has a single-payer health care system that the United States aspires towards, and when the so-called revolutionary countries uh, supposed to have the health care system that people aspire towards. Uh, Canada has a, a third party, uh, the NDP, New Democratic Party, that has a strong base in labor, a social democratic orientation. Uh, wouldn't you think that the so-called revolutionary country should have this NDP? Uh, and so I think that ultimately uh, the page is turning with regard to history, that uh, we're entering a stage, I hope, of an agonizing reappraisal of the origins of the United States of America with creation myths tossed into the dustbin of history. And when that is done, I also imagine that historians will look at the Dominican Republic and ask themselves this question. Uh, why is it in the 1930s that the dictator, Rafael Trujillo, uh, who of course was no progressive, uh, as evidenced by the fact that he was massacring Haitians in the 1930s, and uh, why is it that he opened his doors to Jewish migrants uh, fleeing persecution in Central Eastern Europe. It wasn't because he was progressive, he was trying to whiten the population. And I think that's how you have to look at the, the way that North United States uh, opened its doors to Jewish people as it made this transition from religion to race, which is the subject of my uh, 17th century book and also the subject of my 16th century book as well. And so, as I said, we have a lot of work to do to try to understand this imperialist monster. And I would hope and I trust that our friends on the left will be in the vanguard of this reappraisal process. Understood. Are there any other points you'd like to bring up in closing? Well, um, well, only let, I mentioned my 16th century book, so let, let me get the full title. It'll be out in a few months. The Dawning of the Apocalypse. The Roots of Slavery, White Supremacy, Settler Colonialism, and Capitalism in the Long 16th Century. Uh, as suggested, it talks about why we're here speaking English, not Spanish, how the Spanish were not very good settler colonialists. Uh, they tended to privilege religion. Uh, they even allowed the black conquistadors that they were Catholic, such as exemplified by Juan Garrido. And the scrappy underdog, the Protestants, uh, that is to say London, uh, drew upon a longer tradition, say perhaps going back to the Crusades, a pan-European project beginning in the 11th century, uh, where, 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 where you have pan-Europeanism blending into whiteness. And certainly, if you look at the fact that England expelled this Jewish population two centuries before Spain did in 1492, and then if you look at the history of anti-Semitism in England, Based, many of the modes of persecution targeting the Jewish population were just transferred <laughs> to black people with the Native American people, as you have this transition from religion to race. And so that's the subject of my book uh, out for monthly review press in a few months. Understood. Thank you so much for your time this evening. Next up, I am syndicating here an older interview I recorded in 2016 with the Providence-based union organizer and civil rights activist Mike Arugio, where he speaks about the life of his boxer father, George, 
a legend in New England African-American sports. So, Mike, your dad was George Arugio, and he's a legend in Rhode Island sports history. What's kind of your understanding of his whole life as a boxer? And yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, he grew up in Fox Point. He uh, was born in 1931. Um, so it's the height of the depression. He had a large, came from a large family, um, and his dad was a uh, sailor, so he wasn't home very often. So the older boys and girls had to work, and so one of the things they used to do was um, they used to shine shoes and they used to do other stuff like that um, to kind of make the ends meet. And he started to get sick when he was about five years old. Um, and he was diagnosed with polio. And they sent him to a quarantine island when he was six. And one of the things that they used to do on this quarantine island is that the whoever was taking care of... So the quarantine island was horrifying. Yeah, especially if you're a little child. It was folks with various stages of polio. It was people with syphilis, later stages of syphilis. Um, not a great place for a child to be. Also, it had a lot of the uglier aspects of our country and obviously Little Island. And some of the orderlies used to fight the kids for sport. And he learned to box, um, which is horrifying when you think about it because they had polio. <clears throat> he learned to box on the island. And the legend is that when he was, he got to be a pretty good fighter on the island. And he swam off. Oh, wow. made his way back to, to Providence. Um, and by then, I think he was nine or ten, maybe. Um, and he started to box at the CYO, or the Boys Club, I guess. It might have been the CYO at the time. And was really good. He was a very, very smart uh, fighter. He was considered an intellectual fighter. And at the time, it was sort of like when Joe Lewis was ascendant. So um, <clears throat> every black kid wanted to be Joe Lewis at the time. And he was, he loved it. He loved boxing, he loved um, winning. Um, he also loved that it was a neighborhood kid, and Fox Point produced a lot of really great fighters at the time, so like Manny Almeida, Benny Delgado, um, well, we're five others, but these were some of the great fighters of the era. And they're all Golden Gloves guys. And yeah. Fox Point was considered a, um, in the real training ground mm -hmm. for, for fighters. And so when he turned 15, he turned 12. <clears throat> and started to fight his first professional bouts um, and did great. Um, he also started to not love it as much when he started to turn pro. Um, having a little bit of money allowed him to see, like he bought a house for his mom and was able to send his brothers and sisters to school. And, um, you know, the amount of money I think he's being paid was like twenty-two thousand dollars a year back then. His purses that they were winning on at the, at the actual fights were, I think, in the hundreds of thousands. But he never got his coaches or um, all these other people attached to him. Mobsters took took the money, but he was able to buy a house and do all this stuff. And so he loved that, but he didn't really love <clears throat> fighting other people, right? He didn't like hitting folks. And he realized, like, there was a real issue with, um, uh, one of the things that struck him, and he used to talk about with me all the time, is that he would go out into the ring, and it would be two black fighters in a sea of white faces. Mm -hmm. And that it felt the same as when he was a little boy. Um, fighting in the um, when he was quarantined. Mm -hmm. yeah, this was essentially the same system, but he was a great fighter, and he did great. Um, so after he fought for a few years, uh, started to travel, got to meet folks. He um, used to hang around with the, uh, who are those guys? Uh, the Brat, not the Brat Pack, the Rat Pack. So he, he and um, Frank Sinatra and Sam Davis Jr. were pretty close. And uh, I think he was one of the people that the rumor, the legend is that uh, all these guys were in love with boxing and uh, like the extended group, like the Marlon Brandos and all those guys loved the idea of boxing and um, famously Marlon Brando broke his nose being coached and he ruined the performance of, you know, it's a side story. Um, but he also, with that, that group, they used to fly to Cuba for fun 
Mm -hmm. um, that was like the big spot. That, so they would take a weekend trip to Cuba, gamble, do whatever, and then come back. Um, but it was also Cuba in the early 50s was going through a really pretty serious political upheaval. <clears throat> and he identified that. Mm -hmm. like he saw very clearly a very similar thing. Actually, I guess this was late 40s, not early 50s. Um, <clears throat> saw a real connection in Jim Crow America and um, <clears throat> Jim Crow Cuba. Yeah. Because um, it was identical structures. It was mm -hmm. the leadership of Cuba, the political leadership, and the economic leadership were always uh, white faces, and the people who did the work were always black faces. And it couldn't be ignored. Yeah. Right? And also, as a fighter at that time, um, a lot of the places he would fight would be segregated. Yeah. So he wouldn't even be allowed to walk in the front door of the places that he was filling. Um, <clears throat> you know, the Rat Pack guys, for all their not great attitudes about a lot of things, would not play segregated venues. Mm -hmm. So I think there was like kind of a natural <clears throat> thing with that. So Brown turned 18, um, and he got drafted. And he went to the army, and it was so. 18 would be 1947. I want to say. Yeah, 48. Maybe. 49. 49. 49. Before that, um, <clears throat> the army was still segregated. Yeah. At that point, and he was. Black soldiers were not allowed to. Um, not allowed to combat positions for the most part. Um, they also there's no paths to. Um, officer status and professional athletes tend to go get tracked into those things pretty yeah. quickly. <clears throat> I mean, Joe Lewis was an exception, but it was a segregated army too. And they had him painting lines on baseball fields. That was his official job was to travel around with a baseball field line painting yeah. platoon, I guess, and just do that. And he got recognized by an officer <clears throat> who was like, you're uh, the lightweight contender of the world. What are you doing painting lines for? You should be you should be boxing. And he's like, well, um, you know, I'm, I'm a soldier. I shouldn't really be boxing. He's like, well, you should be coaching. You could be teaching people. You should be teaching it. Your style of kind of this intellectual approach to boxing is something that we all need to see. And we want you to do that. And um, so he coached the Army boxing team and got to travel the world and establish allied boxing teams around the world. So he was the founder of the Turkish boxing team. He coached the Egyptian Army boxing team, the Indian Army boxing team. Um, he got to do exhibition fights in Greece and had a wonderful thing. But so while he was doing that, though, <clears throat> he, um, again, was getting to meet... So his uh, like political experience in America was in almost entirely like this black and white, poor, poor versus rich experience. He didn't really, mm -hmm. the broader world wasn't really open to it. But now he got to see the broader world and got to actually see that it's the same set of people are boxing everywhere. Mm -hmm. Like it's it's immigrant groups, refugee kids, um, the poorest of the poor, the sea of faces that are always looking at them. It's the same people. Mm -hmm. Like it could be the same people in Russia. It could be the same people people in Istanbul that's the same mm -hmm. folks <clears throat> and so he started to really get disillusioned um, with boxing I mean he didn't like getting hit he didn't like hitting people but he also started to really see a problem like a structural problem with it um, so he decided that he wanted to devote his life to something that, that did better mm -hmm. than boxing so and he loved working with kids and he loved stuff like that but he also loved art and he, he got uh, stationed in Franco, Spain in the early 50s mm -hmm. where he got to meet Picasso and got to spend the summer with him painting like okay. how to paint and he loved it it was also a huge political education for him because mm -hmm. Picasso was always critical even though he was like a Spanish national treasure he was always critical of uh, Franco and, and the that fascist bill. Um, and he came back to the United States after he mustered out of the army and um, he wanted to devote more time painting and working with kids. Mm -hmm. He thought that that was where it should go. He also was starting to get more involved in political activism, um, particularly civil rights movement was kind of ramping up with a broader civil rights movement. And Cape Verdeans had always seen themselves, because it's an immigrant African-American population, as not 
having an attachment to the African American experience, um, or at least the same attachment to the African American yeah. experience. But because of what he had been doing as a fighter, um, the audience didn't care if he was Cape Verdean mm-hmm. or not. Like he was an African American fighter. Um, there was no distinction. Um, but he, in the rest of the world, people identified him as his, like he could identify himself as a Cape Verdean. But because he lived in the United States, he was identified as a black American. Yeah. Um, subject to Jim Crow, which is something that he didn't really know about coming from Rhode Island. Because he lived in an entirely different mm-hmm. community. He didn't, had no idea. Um, and so that started to come together for him. And so he started to. Um, he opened up a little studio on Benefit Street and uh, realized that. Uh, so he must have been approaching 30 at this point. So he. Uh, all right, so maybe I'm going to go back a little bit. Um, the Cape Verdeans in Providence do kind of one job in, in Providence, and they were all longshoremen. Mm-hmm. The um, ILA 1328 is an entirely Cape Verdean union. It was founded by Cape Verdeans. Its officers are still Cape Verdeans, it's the majority Cape Verdean. And it's also a very protective union. They also um, were able to keep the, the, the docks honest, mm-hmm. which is a problem that they had in Boston and in New York. Um, and they were all able to keep it open to Cape Verdeans, mostly, yeah. most importantly. And his father, when he wasn't sailing, that's what he did. He mm-hmm. was work the docks like everyone else did, like every Cape Verdean does. Like, if you're not fishing, that's what you're doing. Um, and so when they organized that union, they organized it to protect themselves. And he was attached to it. Um, he was always, you know, he fought in the, the you know, under the banner. Yeah. He was boxing. You know, he came from, you know, from the docks of Fox Point and all that, that whole kind of mythology that gets attached to it. But as an adult, because he had been robbed so heavily by his managers, he had to go to work. He worked the docks like everyone else did. So he, uh, and he loved that connection. But he realized that that, that um, the identity of having an organization, mm-hmm. the the like practical day to day solidarity that they showed, yeah. um, the community solidarity that was part of it, meant so much more to him mm-hmm. than a simple boxing. Thing. Even though the boxing meant a lot to the guys, yeah. that connection meant more to him. Um, and so he started to work actively inside that union with his brothers to kind of expand their strength um, and their political strength, add a little bit slightly more sophisticated political analysis to the to the um, organization, but also to work mm-hmm. and to start to really make a life. He was, uh, um, so then, I guess now it would be about 1960, um, and John F. Kennedy got elected, which, when he was boxing, he would introduce John Kennedy when he was running for Senate from his ring. Um, he established the Peace Corps, and he immediately joined. Mm-hmm. Like, he thought this was a great way, one, to see the world, but also as a boxer and as a union guy, this is a way to really kind of internationalize your personal identity, which is really yeah. great and a wonderful thing to do. He also met my mom around this time, and my mother is Irish from um, Cranston, actually, from right down the street. And um, they kicked him out of the Peace Corps because interracial marriages or relationships were against the law in the majority of states in the country. And um, it was too much for him. He was like, yeah. I got it. We're leaving, we're leaving Rhode Island, we're leaving, we're going to go to a place that will be accepted and safe. So he took the entire family, we moved uh, before us, but moved to New York, where mm-hmm. he um, loved it. Yeah. Again, he's one of those people that could, was able to adapt to kind of wherever he was, but he also loved the cosmopolitanness of it, he loved the, the culture, the access to art, the access to politics was much deeper in yeah. a lot of ways, and he felt he never... He always identified himself as internationalist, like a real internationalist, that there is no, like you can come from a place, but you really belong to every place. Um, and New York was such a really great way, especially following World War II, was such a wonderful place to explore that, right? So you had these huge numbers of refugees from Europe and Asia and Northern and Central Africa 
um, all with really distinct political moments. Access to schools was great. This was the GI Bill. Um, it was like a real kind of intellectual moment mm -hmm. for him. Um, and he was hanging out with all these these kind of these beat deck writers, yes. which he again. It was definitely in his. Yeah. You know, they loved the. They, there was a class identity to the writing, but there was also a. Like a prettier vision than, like, that kind of grim version of Marxism that we all get. And he loved it. Like, that was. He felt at home. Like, a painter. There's room for a painter in that. There's also room for a boxer mm -hmm. in that sort of thing. Um, so he started to work <coughs> in group homes, well, as a cab driver, but also in group homes in New York, establishing some of the first troubled youth group homes that were um, peer or mentor kind of structured. So that the traditional group home structure up until that point was there'd be like an attendant, a state employee attendant who usually didn't come from the community or had some sort of um, weird relationship. Um, to a model that said kids that come from certain communities should have access to people in their communities as a way to develop. And so he kind of helped set up that structure and uh, was never, never really spoke really a lot about it, although we all knew a lot about it. He, um, it was really kind of a revolutionary change in, chi in child care that a peer needs to see somebody that they can identify with and where to help themselves. With. Right. Um, because before then it was just kind of beat it into him, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, as a boxer he was a little he was intimidating, but he was just not. You know, he's a committed pacifist and all this, and he really talked really openly about all that stuff with the kids. Um, and in the late '60s, he actually was held hostage by a group of uh, revolutionary youth from these group homes. They actually were like, "We're taking hostages. We demand reform." And uh, he was like, you're taking a person hostage who agrees with all your reforms. So I'll stay your hostage. That's mm -hmm. fine. I, you couldn't pick a better guy to be your, yeah. <laughs> be your hostage. Um, and ended up delivering the reforms mm -hmm. to, to the, you know, so they wanted control over their own schedule. They wanted control over their teachers. They wanted, you know, the, they wanted autonomy. Yeah. And he agreed with that inside a political framework. And um, they let him go. Mm -hmm. There was no yes. police standoff. He actually convinced the police to go away, and it was like they're just kids. We're going to keep these kids here. They were never armed, even though they actually were, armed and all that stuff. And he worshipped that, mm -hmm. like that ability of people to be able to do, um, like that kind of like a neat ability that folks have to like. Mm -hmm. He just loved that. He feels like that was the same spirit that made him. I like a lot of stuff. And it was just really valuable to him. And so then, um, my mother wanted to go to grad school. So he came back to Rhode Island. Um, he got a job at Brown, where he has a janitor. And he got probably the best job at Brown, which was working as the overnight janitor at the Rockefeller Library. So he got to just hang out and read for eight hours a day, clean up a little and read, and was really active with the union there, which was SEO. I think so. And he um, became really an active member of the local. It was yeah. really um, kind of focused on... He always thought that one of the biggest limitations of unions was that it was still focused on work. Mm -hmm. That it needed to be focused on, like, um, your home life first, and then kind of like, then work will come out of that, and the good work will come out of that. Um, but he really believed that um, uh, if people are redu reduced to just their jobs and actually missing the whole point, yeah, you know, like, and I think he knew that, like, going back to being a, in quarantine, you know, like, they all just saw, like, this poor black kid from Fox Point with mm -hmm. polio and sent him away, but he knew that there was more, right? Mm -hmm. So his goal was always to find more, you know, mm -hmm. that 
you know, cab drivers write operas. You know, every box of paints. Every janitor writes. Like, it's not just, nobody yeah. is that. And so a union's job is to organize the other part of the worker. Yeah. And provide space for the other part to be made real. Mm -hmm. You know, so like if the goal of a worker is to be a sculptor, then the union has to say, that's great. We're going to make sure you work enough to afford whatever material you need. And we'll make sure that we show that work when it's done. That it's the role of a union to provide that mm -hmm. platform. So he uh, painted murals for a lot of the unions, union halls in, yep. the, in Providence. It's like ILA has a mural. Um, Labor is having one of his murals in it. Um, and which was like the most ideal thing, sort of like this inheritance of this like, longer tradition of artists, like labor artists, mm -hmm. contribute giving back to their locals. And like, yeah. you really wanted to do that. And he, he and his brother were, his brother's Mikey Rujo, um, would kind of agitate along those lines. Like, yeah, that's great. You won $5 extra an hour in your paycheck or whatever percentage thereof you want. <coughs> what are you doing at home? Yeah. You know, what books are you reading? You're not? Let me try these. And then making sure you ask about that. So his brother was an officer in the machinist unit mm -hmm. and worked at Brown and Sharp in the late 70s, well, all to the 70s, and was one of the strike um, captains during the big. Mm -hmm. Strike. So he, Georgia, or my dad, and Mikey, we come up with different creative ways of in, like illustrating the message of the strike, like what Brown and Sharp had been doing to the workers in, in Rhode Island, how this is part of a tradition of abuse that Brown and Sharp had going back nearly a hundred years. Like really saying like, you know, it's us today, but it's going to be you tomorrow, and the, um, really kind of tying it together that way. Um, they're still on strike. Mm -hmm. Strike is about 30, 30 so odd years later, almost 40 years later, they're still on strike. Um, at this point, I started to get sick. Yeah. So this was like the early, mid-80s. And um, he would get lost coming home from work. Yeah. And um, I used to meet him after school every day. We'd go to the studio. And uh, um, it's difficult. But yeah. he wasn't really... I mean, you know, if somebody is aware that they're getting sick, they usually intervene on it. One of the, like, really cruel things about, like... Um, cognitive illness yeah. is that you're not cognizant yeah. of, of what's going on. So, or you have moments of, of, of knowing. Um, and so we get lost on his way to work. And sometimes we get call, calls from in the middle of the night from his supervisor on the job saying, uh, where's George? He didn't show up tonight. You know, it's 1230. He was supposed to be there an hour and a half ago. And then he'd have to search, figure out where he went. Usually he would follow the same pattern. He would just go into a different... He would be confused by time. So this went on for a couple of years. And the union, uh, particularly through Karen, Karen Mechanich, went out of their way to look out for his well-being. Mm -hmm. And actually kind of delivered on the promise that unions are supposed to make. Where it's like they looked at the whole family, looked at the whole world, and didn't separate any part of that out. Mm -hmm. They went through, jumped through incredible hoops, making sure that he was protected at work fully, um, and that when it came time for him to stop working, that that process was a smooth process and not one that was going to be jarring to, the, to me or to my mother or to my sister. Yeah. Um, and that was a pretty significant thing. So, you know, as a young man, you know, like I, I had this theoretical idea of what unions always meant and how, like, you know, these dreams of Spain and all this kind of yeah. really militant standing on a barricade. But really what a union does is making sure that the worker has groceries. Yes. Yeah. Um, and that they know how to fill out paperwork. Mm -hmm. And that they show up. Yeah. Um, that it's this much more meaningful kind of day-to-day -day prosaic unionism that is just way more valuable. And so I think, you know, like you struggle against that. Right? Yeah. Uh, especially the way it's taught, because like, you know, my father led this incredibly romantic, world-traveling 
yeah. life. But really what it all comes oh, down to, and what was really important for him, was that really good, stable home life that was caring and loving and a union that was the same right. yeah, reflected the same like attitudes. It. You had meetings where everyone was comfortable to speak, um, whereas like ILA, where everyone was related somehow, not necessarily by blood, but by like a real bond. Mm-hmm. Um, and he made sure that he lived that. So the occurrence to me was that it's not romantic. That if you're looking for the romance, you've missed the point. There's nothing really more romantic than a worker having free time to do the things that they need to yeah. do. And that if the union's not focused on that, you've completely missed the mark. So yeah. that's the lesson I got from it. Mm-hmm. So your dad came of age at a time that was fascinating. He is born in the 30s, and this is kind of the classic period of the heyday of the old left. Yeah. And you're talking about he went to Cuba, so he must have been extremely impressed in one way or another by the Cuban Revolution. Well, yeah, so there's a couple of things about that. Like, the old left and the old unionism in this country was heavily segregated. Yeah. Um, and the story is... Hi there. Hey. Hi, did you um, find your bike? You yeah, yeah, I got a new one. Oh, yeah. okay, good. Yeah. Good. Have you ever been to... There's a guy in Warwick called Mike. That yeah, I got it from him. Okay, I was going to say, that's where I got my bike, and I got, like, a Cannondale for, like, 170 exactly. or something. Really cheap. Exactly. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, thanks. Um, he, um, oh, where was I? Oh, yeah, so, yeah, unions were heavily, heavily segregated. Yeah. Um, IATSE, like, the union that I worked with, had uh, B unionism, which was, like, the black union. Um, the uh, UAW had negotiated, like, memorialization of Jim Crow laws in the 30s and 40s. Like, it was just really not jobs that traditionally had belonged to black people in, in um, America. Um, a lot of black workers were being forced out by organizations. So there was a lot. It was... Um, there was one stream of people that did see kind of through that. Like the, the Communist Party of the U.S. saw kind of past a lot of that. But there was like a huge disconnect between the two. Like ILA had to fight for survival from pressure from the, um, uh, what do you call it, the ethnic unions, like the European ethnic unions, yeah, to maintain control of the docks. And this was like a physical battle mm-hmm. that was happening up and down the coast, because most of the docks were controlled by African-American workers up until that moment. And it was through their organization that they, um, longshoremen are paid as well as they are, not through not through this other thing. And so there's like this annexationist aspect to American unionism that was really devastating. Mm-hmm. Um, but in the 30s and the late 40s, you start to see like a real new vision of it through CIO and the Luther Brothers. Um, that was like a um, not anti-racist, but non-racist unionism. Um, like the anti-racist unionism would come to much, much later. Yeah. You know, and it took like a huge amount of internal caucus and internal union organizing to do that. And I think that he saw that mm-hmm. um, really, really clearly. So there, I think that's part of the reason why black workers don't... It's never just the job. It's always more than the job. It's always um, ability to move in the job. It's the ability to go home. It's the ability to be with your family. And I think that sometimes the needs with European workers were different. Yeah. Um, that it was always economically focused. That's kind of like you're organizing for the right to be left alone. Yeah. Whereas for black workers, it's organizing to maintain community. Yeah. Establishment. So I think those can be two, two opposing goals mm-hmm. sometimes. Um, and I think that he spent a lot of his time trying to negotiate yeah. between those two kind of disparate things. And, like, you see the legacy of that right now. Mm-hmm. Like, um, ILA, which is one of the most powerful unions in Rhode Island, does not, is a member of the AFL, but they don't participate with AFL events, and that's a real loss. Mm-hmm. Um, we also, again, see African-American or traditionally African-American org- organizations getting passed over yeah. again. And I think that there's a lot of difficulty in that. So there's skepticism in um, see now that Cape Verdeans are four generations, three generations in here and part of the larger African American culture 
um, there's still a huge amount of skepticism about the ability of unions to affect that community. Mm -hmm. Like, the focus went from African Americans in the 40s, 50s, and 60s to immigrant workers in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, and there was never a fulfillment of the promise that was supposed to be there, mm -hmm. that labor was supposed to have. Um, leadership of unions is largely not, has never done really great recognizing this. They're trying to, mm -hmm. um, but it means it's very, very few people who can fight through a um, exclusionary space. My dad constantly fought through exclusionary spaces. Yeah. And I think that that takes an emotional and physical toll on people. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that doesn't always get recognized. Yeah. And I think that when people are developing leadership, and I think this is one of the things that he was trying to do with group homes, was that he understood that there needed to be a peer-to-peer and peer-to-mentor kind of leadership. It's not, it's a cadre building. Yeah. That's really what he's, he was doing. Um, that uh, if you can't, if you don't have a place to go to where you can be completely safe, and that means um, allowed to be angry or allowed to be sad or allowed to go through this entire thing, you can't actually speak freely. Mm -hmm. um, and that democracy never actually happens until those things can happen. Yeah. Um, and he believed that. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think my mother believed that. I think uh, I know his brothers believe that. Yeah. Freddie and Mike believe that. Um, you know that there's a uh, it's like these two very distinct things. Yeah. Right. So one of the interesting things is Cape Verdeans are very known for their piety and relationship to the Catholic Church in some re yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, you know at the same time the Catholic Church uh, with like Catholic schools one of the unsaid things was always you send your kids to Catholic schools so you don't have to deal with quote unquote those problems yeah, which right. is in a setting like New York code for segregation so how did he negotiate that because the Catholic Church in Rhode Island was not very like on board with the whole anti segregation no 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 in fact um, it was actually rare Catholic churches that were good at um, in Fox Point there's the big church Grace is it, what's the name of that church um, there's the big church they moved the highway for the church right yeah um, which is a whole other story so during the depression um Shipping slowed down. Yeah. Um, all industries slowed down. There were huge numbers of unemployed. I mean, it's a, it was a great depression. Right? Yeah. Um, everyone was affected. The, that Catholic Church is a major, majority um, Azorian. So Azorian are a majority white set of islands about 500 miles off of Lisbon. Um, volcan beautiful volcanic islands. Um, and they have a very kind of a similar like a parallel history to Cape Verde but a very very different one so like whereas Azores are like these really really beautiful islands Cape Verde are desert islands one of them is entirely made of salt like it's like a, a very stark one versus the other um, the Azorean population was so like if if Portugal was more cosmopolitan because it was attached to Spain. Mm -hmm. Azores was the exact opposite of Cosmopolitan. It was a lot of, in a lot of ways, it was uh, kind of backwater. Incredible backwater. Uh, they had, they practiced a Catholicism that, and like Catholicism wasn't very advanced in the 1930s, but they practiced like a, a medieval version of Catholicism. Yeah. The women had to be fully shrouded all the time. This is a tropical island. Yeah. Um, you know, there's belief in witchcraft. There's a lot of really kind of ugly things. And they came here as, as, they should, as fishermen and sailors and all that stuff. Um, did not work the docks. But when they, that church opened up its soup kitchens, it, the soup kitchens were segregated. Yeah. They would not allow Cape Verdeans to, to eat until every Azorian had eaten, which there are obvious problems with that. So the Cape Verdean response in 
in part of the point was to open up the Sheldon Street Baptist Church in nearly most, if not a significant number of Cape Floridians became Baptists mm-hmm. on, on that day. In fact, that church is like the holder of the probably the most complete archive of Cape Floridian births in life in um, Mm-hmm. The, the Catholic, the other church, did not really do a great job recording baptisms or weddings. Mm-hmm. The stuff that churches are actually supposed to do to establish lineage and establish worship. So yeah, um, you know, I think they're they're religious, but not religious to the degree that that um, Azorians were religious. I think that there was a a uh, um, you know like there always was a so one of the things about Cape Verde that's kind of important to know is Cape Verde was treated one as a slave stage area, right? So that was where they would prep and break. Slaves before they ship them. Yeah, the Goree Island. Yeah. Right. Um, it was also the main watering point for all whale boats leaving Nantucket. Mm-hmm. It's the only water in the center of the Atlantic. Um, it was also a concentration camp. Mm-hmm. So any political dissident from Portugal was sent to. Uh, mm-hmm. It was their own devil's island. Um, and so because of that, there were Cape Verdeans were relatively politically sophisticated to a degree more than Azorians. Mm-hmm. And also because of the amount of shipping that passed through yeah. them, they were also more cosmopolitan. Mm-hmm. They, they really believed that they were, yeah. you know, it, not that Cape Verdeans ever not identify as Cape Verdean, but they definitely identified as an international mm-hmm. people. Um, Cape Verdean Creole is spoken in Angola, yeah. you know, which is in China. Um, you know, as navigators and sailors, we, Cape Verdeans re- represent a disproportionately large percentage of the um, command set structure of whale boats. Mm-hmm. So they tended to be the, the rowers or the actual Cape Verdean boats, yeah. or the harpooners, or um, Cape Verdeans and people from the South Sea Island. Right. Yeah. Um, it's an interesting, so it makes for an interesting, um, but also made for a slightly less superstitious population. Yeah, so the church in Cape Verde, or for Cape Verdeans, occupies the same place it does for African Americans. Yeah. Um, central community, also one of the only safe places to be. Um, not subject to really close scrutiny by the state. So it allowed for a slightly freer drive. Yeah. yeah. And so because of that, folks like Amil Carp Brawl and the liberators of um, like Angola and Guinea Bissau and um, Cape Verde were were significantly more sophisticated in their political concepts. Um, so like place like when my dad goes to a place like Cuba, it was a very familiar like that's not would not have been completely the stories would have still been told. It, it's a um, like the, the intellectual recognition would have been there. It's the personal identity that needs to be mm-hmm. Yeah. And so you just kind of alliterate to something. How did your dad, but the wider community, react to the liberation struggle in the post-colonial world during the 70s with Amico Cabral and those sort of stuff? Huge. Because it, it was a, a huge... So there was always... Um, <clears throat> so like Cape Verdeans, because those islands aren't... Um, they're not native populated. Mm-hmm. They were populated specifically by slaves from um, eastern and central, eastern central Africa. Um, I think most Cape Verdeans can trace back to Ethiopia or that yeah. area, the south. Um, there was always a kind of pan-African mm-hmm. instinct. Um, Amilcar Cabral uh, was from an oral. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So there was like this recognition, like the same way that Shea was from Mexico initially, right? Mexico? Argentina. Some of those places. Um, not Cuban. Yeah. Um, that there's a internationalist. So when um, Cape Verde was finally free, it meant you could go there. Mm-hmm. It was very, very hard to travel back and forth 
especially following World War II. Like before World War II, there really weren't a lot of passports or anything like that. People could just yeah get back and forth without too much trouble. There were always boats going through that. After World War II, though, um, um, boats became more sophisticated, but also border control became much more sophisticated. So you didn't see huge waves of immigration from Cape Verde. Also, the United States had really strict quotas on who was allowed in and out. So, um, Northern and Western Europeans were number one. Um, some sets of Asians were number two. Like, it was a very complicated formula. The Cape Verdeans did not factor into that formula. Um, following liberation, though, you saw, um, because almost everyone's related, the ease of travel increased significantly. So you had this, this break in culture where you have first and second generation Cape Verdeans who came at the turn of the century or slightly before, um, and then you see the um, immigration kind of stop during like the real fascist era of the 30s. Before, and then immediately post World War II, you see another little spike, and then you see this nothing. You see nobody coming to the country for about 30 years, yeah, um, up until the 70s, and then suddenly you see this new wave of immigration come in, and there's going to be a disconnect. So, like the first and second generation Cambodians, for the most part, didn't speak Creole. Mm-hmm. Um, they were doing their best to assimilate, yeah, um, and worked really, really hard to do that. Um, the generation that came afterwards, because they kind of were children of a nationalist movement, all of them saw language as part of identity. So there was a, a new interest in learning Creole, there was an mm-hmm. interest in, in the culture, in not assimilating, not assimilating, but maintaining identity. Yeah. And also because being one of the few parts of African American culture in the United States that actually can identify where they come from with the national identity makes it unusual and, and uh, in a lot of ways, more welcoming. Mm-hmm. And I think that there was a, you know, there's always going to be tension between the, the folks who are nationalist identified and, and the folks that came before that, that at the same time, there's never going to be a uh, wall between the two of them. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think there's definitely a, a identity of that. And also, um, African cultures tend to be ancestor based. Yeah. So the folks that came before were always like, thank you for being here. You built these houses, you established these jobs, you formed this union that welcomed me, you did this thing. Yeah. You know. Um, yeah, so it was like a pretty significant thing. When they, that wave that came in the mid, mid to late 70s um, ran the garbage trucks yeah. in, in province. They were extracted from the garbage trucks, but they ran the garbage trucks. Um, and it was great. It was like part of like kind of an American, a real American experience that they really embraced. But at the same time, mm-hmm. you know, there was still a definite connection to the homeland that uh, older generation Cape Britons didn't have but really, really wanted. Yeah. And I think that, that was something that was really good. So you see... Um, Cape Verdean mutual aid societies go from being church-based to being social-based or political-based. Yeah. And that was, like, probably the biggest Mm -hmm. change. But I think that groundwork had already been kind of laid. Mm -hmm. Church-based ones had a political um, framework. There were the bars going on, right? But, um, you saw a real expansion, a more, a greater sophistication. Because one of the things that's really funny is that the previous generations that came, not isolated in the world, but they come to the United States, like immigrants do, and they're like, "Look what I get! Look what I get!" You come from salt. You come from an island of salt. Like now you can do all exactly. this other stuff. But then this wave came following the revolution, and they were far more politically sophisticated than. Mm-hmm. than the folks who have been in the United States. And they have much clearer analysis of colonialism and the way race works and a very different thing, whereas the folks that had stayed understood racism in a kind of post-Jim Crow context, mm-hmm. which is a really, really different thing. And so one of the really interesting things about it that's happened lately um, is that there's a move of... Like there's a third exodus of Cape Verdean. They're moving into the south. Mm-hmm. They're moving to place, settling in places like Alabama, um, which are you think is kind of crazy. But then 
as an African American immigrant population, that is a great. It's a fishing based society. Yeah. It's very similar to Rhode Island in a lot of ways. Because yeah. of that. That's kind of a way to reestablish a new set of rules. And uh, I've had people tell me basically in the last 40 years now the South has done a lot more to improve yeah. aspects. Yeah. Yeah. The Northeast is considered the most segregated part of the country right now. It is. Yeah. 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 Um, and also, you know, when you look at the history of social movements in the country, the really hugely transformative ones were Southern-based. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, including labor. Yeah. Including St. Louis and all that. Yeah. So, yeah. So what do you think lessons can be taken away that young people can learn? Because this is kind of going to be for a Black History Month mm-hmm. thing. Um, but there's a lot. There's... Um, Solidarity is a real thing. It has to be built into a community. And it has to actually be worked on. Um, that um, as much as you can love the place that you're from, you are actually a citizen of the entire planet. Mm-hmm. Um, and that you know, immigrant populations have really great understanding, and African American populations, um, I think, get that in a way that other people don't. Mm-hmm. Like I think that. Be, some folks believe that it's like a perceived ownership of the planet, whereas if you kind of are always cast adrift by society, then you mm-hmm. have access to the entire world. Um, mm-hmm. It gives you this real, real uh, solidarity with the rest of the planet that exists. Um, also that the really, really important struggles are ones that may not seem really, really dramatic, but have the greatest impact. The ability for people to go home and be with their families has more to do with well-being and good work life than anything else. Um, also, that the African experience in the United States is the United States is part of Africa mm-hmm. by population, by identity. Uh, culturally, the African culture is a dominant culture in a lot of ways. In the mm-hmm. It's okay to own it. Yeah. And not be afraid of it. Like, recognize that your idiom, your music, your language has been the thing that defines youth and also defines history in this country. Um, and that you're part of a much longer, much longer history and mm-hmm. way longer future based on that, which is really exciting. Mm-hmm. So, like, and that new organizing in unions is going to be focusing really heavily on our population. Yeah. And I'm very excited about the future of that. Mm-hmm. Thanks for listening, and be sure to tune in next week. This is the Washington Babylon Podcast, hosted by Ken Silverstein and produced by Andrew Stewart.